Welcome back. How was practice round one and qual round one? Was it harder than you thought? Don't worry, we're gonna talk about it. Before we dive in, we need to talk about some issues that came up in PR1 and Qual Round 1. First of all, if you have an issue during the round, check the documentation on the AGI website and the Stellar Explorers website. Secondly, everyone needs to have an educational license for the second round, and that needs to be requested as soon as possible. Third, you need to make sure that your software is running before the round, and so that means you need to check that STK works with that educational license, and that needs to be done before you start your six hour time period. Lastly, class marker. Know your login. Um, you're taking valuable time away from yourself by having to email and request these things during your round. Okay, let's talk about three easy ways for you to improve your scores. So first, set time goals. Um, at the beginning of each round, write down exactly what you wanna be doing at each hour and check in on your team every hour to make sure that you've reached those goals. Second, fill out the study guide. I know from personal experience and the fact that I see these quizzes that you can find everything you need for these quizzes on the study guide. So make sure you look at that before your round begins and I guarantee you'll be getting a better score on your quiz every time. Third of all, check your files before you submit. Okay, moving on, let's get to what you all wanna hear. Practice round one and qual round one. So the most important part of the first round about orbital planning is knowing your classical orbital elements. If you still don't quite understand those, there's a really good document on the Stellar Explorer's website. It's called Understanding Orbital Elements, and you need to read it. That's, that's just the baseline. Um, if you still don't quite understand what's going on with orbital elements, leave a comment. I'll try to get back to you and explain it a little in a, in, in a different way. Um, okay, so the basics with any orbital planning mission is that you need to know how to manipulate the shape of your orbit. Um, there's a couple different ways to do this. I think in STK, it defaults to using a semi-major axis and eccentricity. However, the two teams that I was on, we generally used apogee and perigee just because it was easier to conceptualize and the things written in the scenario booklet tend to align with apogee and perigee. However, at the end of the day, it's up to you. If you can do the calculations, if it works, then it works. And if it fits the requirements, then it fits the requirements. Um, I'll be speaking in terms of apogee and perigee simply because that's what I've worked with. And so let's talk about this energy constraint that you guys had in the qualification round. Um, basically, the way that orbits work is that as you increase the semi-major axis, you're increasing the energy needed for the orbit. So you would need like a larger launch capability. However, because you're limited in your launch capability, you have to lower the perigee in order to maintain that energy requirement. So if you're raising your apogee, you need to lower your perigee to keep the energy the same. However, on the flip side, if you lower your perigee, you now have the choice to raise your apogee. There's a really good analogy for this. Um, think about it this way. If you walk into a store and you have $10, right? you can go to the dollar section and pick up 10 items. Now, if you want an additional item, you can't buy 11 items. You have to put an item back so that you always have 10 items from the dollar section. However, you can put an item back and just leave the store with only nine items and leave the store with an extra dollar. Um, that's, that's the way that you should be thinking about the energy requirement. There are also a few more uh, classical orbital elements that you can use to fine-tune your orbit to the mission at hand. Um, the first one is the inclination. That defines the highest latitude that your orbit will go. It also defines the tilt of the orbit as it circles the Earth, right? And then you have the right ascension of the ascending node, which is also called the RAN. That is the swivel. You can use it to move the orbit around the Earth. 
Um, there's also the argument of the perigee, which defines where the perigee or, or the closest point the satellite will pass over the Earth is. And then there's the true anomaly, which defines where in the orbit the satellite starts. So in general, personally, I would adjust the apogee, perigee, inclination, ran, and argument of the perigee before I even touch the true anomaly, because the true anomaly will change depending on all the other classical orbital elements. Um, so in general, the inclination is a really easy place to start just because you know what the highest latitude that you want to reach is depending on the GPS locations of your site of interest. And so you use the inclination to set your orbit a little bit above or a little bit below that latitude. The last thing we're going to talk about is Kepler's second law. So in a very simplified version of this, basically what's happening is that for any delta t or any period of time, an orbit will sweep the same area. So if you look at this picture, um, the, the areas shown by the radius sweeping from the purple orbit, uh, those two areas are equal in time. So what does that tell you about the speed of the orbit? Well, it tells you that when the orbit is closer to the planet, the satellite will be moving faster, whereas when it's further away, it will be moving slower. So pause the video here and then look at these two orbits and find where they're going to be moving the fastest and where they're going to be moving the slowest. Right, so the satellite should be moving fastest relative to the Earth at the perigee and slowest relative to the Earth at the apogee. Now, let's think about this. We have an orbital element that we can adjust to adjust the perigee, right? The argument of the perigee. So if we can change where the perigee is, we can also change where the apogee is. And so we can define where our satellite will be collecting the most data by where the apogee is. So this has just been a really quick overview of some of the things that my teams would have considered in creating our orbits. Um, so that's all I have for you today. I'll be coming out with another video after practice round two with how I would have approached um, a satellite creating scenario um, because that's, that's what practice round two is. Remember to get your educational license, to know your class marker login, and to make sure that Excel is working on your computer. And good luck in practice round two.